When you see a covered hopper in a train, it's a fair assumption that it's carrying grain. This car type has become synonymous with the transportation of wheat, corn, beans, and pretty much any other dry bulk agricultural commodity. However, this car is a fairly recent development in the railroad industry. While the concept was experimented with off and on since 1862, the modern covered hopper emerged during the Great Depression, but only gained traction in the grain industry in the 1950s. So before then, how was bulk grain shipped? The short answer is that it was carried in boxcars. Refrigerator cars were common too, enough so that the Interstate Commerce Commission sent out instructions to avoid plugging up the ice bunkers with 2,800 pounds of packed wheat. Automobile boxcars were common too. The Rock Island even stenciled their automobile cars to put grain in them. And yeah, stock cars could be used as well after wrapping the thing with burlap and craft paper better than any Christmas gift. There was one specific device that made bulk grain shipping in boxcars possible, the grain door. The name implies that this is some kind of specialized stop in the boxcar's entryway. And while new complicated contraptions and doodads were patented twice a month under this name, the vast majority of grain doors were simply wooden boards nailed to the inside door frame. The grain door is not normally visible to the public, as it lines the inside of the car and is covered by the sliding door at all times except when loaded and unloaded. So this is a nearly forgotten piece of railroad technology. The earliest permanent grain door that was built integrally to the boxcar was described in 1879, but the concept of the grain door originated many years earlier. Boxcars are not ideal for bulk loading, yet an entire industry was built around devising ways to keep grains inside. Loading the car was the easiest part of the process. After a grain door is nailed in place, key locations on the car's interior are plastered with burlap, cheesecloth, and paper sheeting in a process called coopering. This material was supposed to come with the car at the railroad's expense, but railroad companies balked at the cost of providing quality materials, and many lawsuits were fought between the agricultural industry and the railroad industry over the financial responsibility of a well-sealed car. Once the car was sealed, it was loaded mechanically. In the early days, it might have been loaded with this one horsepower belt elevator. By the 1890s, pneumatic loaders powered by belts connected to stationary engines were invented that used air to spray the grains into the ends of the car like a fire hose. Once the car was loaded to the maximum level that was marked on the interior walls, a government inspector checked the load. The car door was closed and locked and often sealed with more paper strips on the exterior and the boxcar sent on its way to be put on a train. In between the origin and the terminal, however, was a dangerous journey. The annual planting and harvest, when cars were needed for shipping grains, were also periods of high demand for other commodities as well, often resulting in car shortages. The boxcars that were available to grain shippers often had busted sheathing, loose doors, cracked floors, holes in the walls, or even damaged kingpins through which the grain could leap. Sometimes the grain doors themselves were faulty. Commodity loss in transit was a huge problem. To many elevator operators, it seemed like the railroads were intentionally providing them with the worst cars in the system. In 1908, one government inspector estimated that 70% of all boxcars loaded with grain leaked their loads in transit. That is 7 in 10 cars. A third of the cars leaked through the end walls, a third through the side walls, and a handful leaked at the doorposts, drawbars, or car corners. The grain doors did their part as only 5% actually leaked from the doors. When World War I came around, demand for grains skyrocketed and car leaks were considered an issue of national security, as up to 10% of the United States grain production was lost in transit due to the poor condition of railroad equipment. Through careful and dedicated efforts, by 1917, the 70% of leaking boxcars was reduced to approximately 16%, but this was still a significant number. A better class of equipment would stop some of the leaks, for many of them are due to the poor physical condition of the cars in which the grain is loaded," exclaimed an exasperated shipper in the Grain Dealer's Journal in January 1918. Rolling stock has deteriorated and continues to deteriorate. Perhaps it is too much to expect the carriers to build and maintain a sufficient number of grain cars to handle the crops each year. The development of steel-sheathed box cars eventually solved the problem of leakage from the body but grain doors were still required to keep the grains from leaking out of the car door. Unloading boxcars full of grain posed a particular problem. 
Boxcar floors are flat. Once the grain doors are punched out, either with crowbars or the iron fist of a pneumatic grain door remover, only a small portion of the load will flow out on its own. At the low end of the unloading scale was a shovel truck, merely a scoop on wheels pushed by a man, which could take several hours to unload a single car. At the high end of the scale were ridiculous industrial-grade Rube Goldberg machines that tilted, twisted, shifted, and shook the cars like a giant game of iron twister. These massive mechanisms certainly reduced labor costs and sped up unloading times, but the United States Department of Agriculture found that they only made economic sense at terminals that unloaded 10 million bushels of grain or more. The expense of operating and maintaining a mechanical unloader exceeded profits at terminals that unloaded 3 million bushels or less, so pure sweat and elbow grease with scoops and shovels were the only options at smaller elevators or mills. Once the car was unloaded, the grain door was salvaged if the pneumatic door remover hadn't damaged it beyond repair. The Baltimore and Ohio Terminal Elevator in Baltimore, Maryland, had a dedicated grain door recovery plant. Because the railroad paid for the grain doors, these were considered valuable property no matter how simple or beat up they were. Many were marked with the railroad's reporting marks with return instructions to send back to the yard of origin. After World War II, the culture of rampant, unchecked consumerism hit the grain industry, and the problem of damaged or insufficient grain doors was solved by flooding the market with low-cost, single-use doors, typically made out of resin-impregnated paper, composited canvas, or thin sheet metal. Placement and removal was easy with a single man, saving huge labor costs as well. Opening a single-use grain door was as easy as hacking it open with a hatchet, instead of reusable lumber piling up at terminals, landfills began filling up with millions of these sliced-up doors. But the 1950s spelled the beginning of the end for shipping grain in boxcars. The covered hopper had proven its worth in shipping dry bulk goods like cement, lime, and carbon black. In the 1960s, Canadian experiments in using covered hoppers for grain that began in 1921 finally caught hold in the larger North American railroad industry. Both the grain industry and the railroad industry finally agreed that the solution to all of their problems – loading, leaking, unloading, labor costs, contamination, and car shortages – lay in specializing the railcar fleets. The grain door was then extinct.